Welcome back to CEE 120 C 223 in session two today. <coughs> we are going to go ahead and start exploring the whole world of how we can be using Dynamo and these different kind of scripting approaches to assist us with the design. And specifically today, what we're going to be looking at is really how we can move from just moving around geometry in the Dynamo world, you know, doing different mathematical things to create lines and points and curves and circles, to actually controlling Revit components. So we'll continue to go through and work with points and lines and curves and things like that. But what we're going to be doing is using that as the basis for actually locating or controlling objects in Revit. Okay, and just get going. Welcome back. Okay, so in terms of a recap from where we were last time, just to sort of set the stage, what we did last time really more than anything besides explaining about the core structure was just kind of started playing with Dynamo. And in Dynamo, there's all these different sort of things that we can do. We looked about the interface a little bit. In terms of the interface, oh, we looked at there being several big main places that we were looking at, a function browser, a map area, okay, which a lot of people call the graph, and then a background, which is showing some geometry in the background, as well as a run button. So those are kind of the big kind of chunks in the Dynamo environment. Again, in Dynamo, um, to open Dynamo, what we need to do is just have any old Revit file open. When you open Dynamo, it's always associating itself with the current Revit file. So if you um, do something with a Revit file, you need to open the Revit file first before you open the Dynamo file. They're, they're kind of paired to a specific file. <coughs> so I'm just gonna open up a brand new Revit file. It don't really matter with what template. Again, just recapping this interface. Okay, so here we are in Revit. In Revit, Dynamo is existing under the Add-ins tab. You see, I actually have a couple different versions loaded. I have an older one and the most current version, Dynamo 0.9. If you need to install that on your machine, there's that Dynamo BIM.org site where you can download and install the latest version. And when you bring up Dynamo, it looks something like this. Actually, it looks a lot like this. Let's see what's going on. Little wheel spinning. Okay, in the Dynamo environment here, there's the whole notion of new, which is where we're going to tend to work often. There's the notion of opening an existing file or creating a custom node. We're going to get into that in just a little bit where as we go through and create these different graphs that kind of relate all these different nodes together, we can start creating what you might think of as either functions or subroutines where we have little sub blocks of functionality that have inputs and outputs and link a lot of different graphs together. So that's what a custom node is. There's our recent files. There's also a whole discussion forum and a lot of video tutorials that are out there. So a lot of resources. I usually go blasting right through the screen and don't pay much attention to it. There's a lot of stuff available to us out there. When we actually open the Dynamo window, again, what we're looking at is this main area of the screen. That's what I'd call typically the graph. There's sort of two different modes. There's the node view and the background view. So depending upon which one you have selected, whether it's the node, or the background looks about the same right now, but these controls for panning, this is panning with four arrows, zooming in, zooming out, and that right there is pitch view. So if you have something selected, that, that one will always sort of expand whatever you have selected to fill the view. Okay, will affect what's going on in the background there. Um, this is what I call the function browser. The most important thing is to sort of understand about the function browser that has different is loaded in here. All of the default nodes kind of part of Dynamo. I have a few extra ones that may not be in yours, like Flux, right now. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, you can load in different packages. There's this whole open source community where people develop different nodes and throw them out there and make it available to you. And then we'll show up in that little graph over there. But your basic operation is typically <coughs> something like this. For example, if you know that you want to do something to create a point, I typically just type in point and you'll get kind of an ordered list of the most common things people do, whether it's going to be by coordinates, by series <coughs> coordinates. There's different things that involve points. And when you click on one of those functions, 
It'll sort of explain to you what's going on and then put that node into the graph. So here we're in the graph view, we can sort of see it. If I switch over to the background view, you'll see the graph disappears temporarily. And in the background view, I pick up another icon, I pick up an orbit. So I can also orbit that. It wouldn't make sense to orbit the graph, but it does make sense to orbit the background view. Glenn, yes. my background view is just a flat grid. That's an interesting one. Angat had that the other day. And I'm trying to figure out why that is. Go, go back to the background and see if we can orbit it. So it let us. I've tried orbiting. It doesn't move. This is very um, strange. Like did you, Anga, did you clicking did, on the yeah? scroll just hands when it's the orbit? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. It, it was, was just on that, that machine. Yeah. Can you try this reopening dino? I'm sort of yeah, curious. Just and it still has that. Yeah. Uh, let's go into the view for a second. Let's see if there's anything under there that might be hiding. I like the view as well. <laughs> preview? I don't know. Yeah, I might just for right now move look up to a different yeah. machine. But it's that's a very strange ship, and I haven't actually seen that. Except, you know, I'm gotten you it's twice, so you know there's some consistency. Yeah. But I'm not sure what causes that. Or even worse, how to fix it. Okay, so we have functions, we have a draft with different nodes in it, we have a 3D view in there, and the ever popular down at the bottom, either the run button or the automatic button. What that's all about is really, do we want things to update automatically or manually? If we choose manual, the run button will appear. The advantage of doing things manually is, every once in a while as you're working, you're doing a lot of reorchestrating and replumbing everything, and you don't necessarily want it updating automatically. It takes a little computation time to do that. So this is well, like Excel. You can sort of say only update when I want you to versus having you do it automatically. So if you keep it on manual, the disadvantage is you have to remember to hit run, you know, but it tends to be faster. If you leave it on automatic, it'll automatically update, but you have a little bit of overhead every time you change anything. Yeah, okay. I think I got what the issue is. Oh, really? And what, what can you find? So it's available to you. something. Let me just share that with uh, on the video too. So it's under background preview. There's available previews. So if I turn off background preview, it goes flat. If I turn on background preview, what's that? Interesting. I think the 2D versus 3D, sheet view versus the 3D. Interesting. The other one just to know about is over here, the Revit background preview. That is, do you want to see the points showing up in your Revit file in the background too, or only in your uh, Dynamo file? What's that? Okay, so we have our basic environment. We'll keep on playing around with it. Actually, one other thing I want to like make you aware of just relative in the environment is that as you add different nodes together, you're going to find that after a while these graphs get very cluttered and crowded and all that kind of stuff. So let me kind of show you some, what you can do to sort of help with that. I use it a lot in my code. If I, for example, put in, oh, I'm going to put in like 0, 10, and 10, three values, so I want to have that as my x, y, z.
And I actually think of that as doing something. It's almost like a little subblotch of code that's kind of creating that point. What I can do is take different nodes that I like to have working together and highlight them. And if you right click, you can say create a group out of them. And that just sort of puts them in a little box that'll keep them together. So I'll just call it create a point. The nice thing about grouping things is when you move things around, they sort of move together. The color can be used to organize things a little bit, so it makes it a little bit easier for people to read and debug your code. If you right click on this even, you can sort of change the color. If you want to use color to sort of color coordinate uh, what's going on. But this environment is actually pretty nice in terms of being able to group things and all that kind of stuff. Now, a couple things that work with the grouping put some spherical coordinates in here. If I choose the group and then shift click to select the other item, I can say add it to the group and it'll get added in there. If I choose a node and I right click and say, actually, let's see if I can do it just on this. I want to say remove from group. It'll take it back out of the group. Um, um, what you do is you grab um, the group, so not the individual items, but the group, and then you shift click to grab the other nodes, and you say add the group. Now, one last thing on just random interface stuff to know about. As you're working along here, as you move groups, they kind of move as a whole. So it's kind of this weird thing. If you want to move a node within a group, what do you do? And what you do then is you hold down the control key. Oops, where's the option key? Hang on, let's try it. Control, yeah, if I hit the control, you can sort of like uh, slide that around. It's moving without me holding anything down, though. Say again? It moves it in the group without holding anything down. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little different on you here. Have, yeah, you have it all connected because I just pressed one of the two. Just yeah. click for note. Because I clicked it, yeah, you can see. Interesting. I always do the control key. Does that work for everyone? Maybe it's on, uh, I'm always worried about what works on my Mac and what doesn't. Okay, let's try that again. See, I go click it in here. Oh, now you're correct. That's interesting. So what is it? Maybe it's just one you're hitting in the background. Versus right on them. Thank you for like a, so the key is I think to deselect and make sure you only have the node selected. Okay, I think that's it. Vivi, we eventually get to the bottom of this. We're all learning, it's good. Okay, so we started out with just some basic interface stuff. Within that, then, we looked about how we create numbers, and we had different ways of creating numbers, whether it was sort of creating individual numbers or creating arrays. We looked at different ways of creating arrays, number sequences versus code blocks. We'll do some more of that today. We also looked at how we could use basic arithmetic functions, like adding, multiplying, dividing, as well as some of the like sines and cosines and geometric functions formulas to sort of tie them together. So we'll see a lot of that today. <coughs> Finally, we started with the very basics, which is could we go ahead and just create some points, create some lines that have you know, starting points and end points, and then even create some curves. So just very basic geometry creation. So that's where we were, and that's all really good relative to kind of working <coughs> within the Dynamo environment, but we want to move a little bit beyond that right now. So what I want to do is actually start thinking about how we can use the geometry we're creating to actually control Revit components, Revit families, or Revit systems yeah. objects like walls and roofs and floors, things like that. But before we dive into that, I want to just sort of, at a high level, talk about just the overall pattern we tend to use as we're doing this stuff. Because there really is kind of a typical flow. There's a typical you know, way of arranging things. And if you always think about it in these steps, I think it'll make your life a little bit easier as you start doing these graphs. At some level, I tend to think about the world of Dynamo in this way. In fact, the world of most programming in this way. Let me see if I can zoom that up. You basically tend to approach the world of programming as get something, compute something, do something with that information. And it's really, you know, if you go that way, it tends to actually be pretty straightforward about what you're doing. On the get side, 
we often go ahead and get some data. We either get data from the Revit model where we can get individual elements that we select or all the elements. We can get some faces of things. Or we can even just get parameters from those elements. So if you have specific elements, you can say, give me the height or give me the width or give me some sort of data about it. Okay? A lot of times we get it directly from Revit. We're eventually going to start getting external data. We'll get data from Excel spreadsheets or XML files or things on the web. We'll get data from other sources. But we'll take those objects and we'll take that data and we'll combine it together. We're going to do some sort of computing. And in terms of that computing, there's all sorts of different patterns. I'll try to call out patterns when we're using them. There's a lot of patterns that have to do with the relationships between objects. So things we can do like just sort of say, what is the distance between that object? And then based on the distance, decide, well, what do we want to do? Do we want to decide that when things are closer, do they attract each other? Do they get bigger? Do they amplify? Or do they repel? Do they get smaller? Do they turn into an undesirable color? We often go through and have things react how close things are. Another sort of pattern we often look at is if you do things face things. So do you face the sun? Do you face the view? Do you face the north side or the south side? So we look at just really what they face, what the directionality is. A third pattern that's kind of an interesting one we will do is reflecting. That's the whole notion if sun or rays or sound was hitting my surface and it reflected off, you know, what would it hit? So it's the whole notion of it's not exactly do you, what you face, but it kind of gets into your incident angles and what a reflection off of you would hit. So a lot of different things we can look at. So we look at the relationships and sort of the behavior you want them to have. And I'm going to keep on calling out different patterns because there's all these different ones. And it turns out the attractor relationships are really common, common one. We do that an awful lot when we're trying to figure out just we're changing the behavior of things or the way things are colored or indicated based on how close they are to other things, so proximity. Then we're going to do something. To do something is typically going to be going to be either we're going to place some elements based on these calculations, or we might set the parameters of those elements. We might set the color, we might set the height, we might set just something about it based on whatever we compute. But I'm going to keep on calling out things in terms of that basic pattern because it'll give you just a little bit of organization as we uh, start looking through the different examples and you start organizing your own work. So let's close that up. Today, we are going to look at things that are all about just controlling rivet elements. So let me kind of show you some common functions that we're going to use a lot of. We tend to do a lot of placing of different elements. And when we're placing different elements, what we tend to do is either go through and say we have a specific rivet family. We're going to get that family using something called family types. And we're going to place it by giving the point where to put it. Okay, that's a very common thing. Basically, choose a family and tell me where to put it. There's a variation on that. We have a type of Revit component a little bit different than the standard Revit family, where standard Revit families are kind of static. You put them in there at a point, and they have a specific size and shape based upon how you model them. Adaptive components are kind of cool. What they do is they go through and let you have several placement points, and they'll deform their shape to match those different placement points. So it's not a single point. So you can have things that deform and warp and shape themselves based upon how you want to put things on. So for example, in our Revit family world, if we were thinking about the facade of a building, we'd put, oh, rectangular panels with glass and a frame on the side of the building. They'd all kind of be the same size. and would be very regular, they'd all be the same. In an adaptive component world, we'd say, hey, we have this undulating, curvaceous, organic facade. We're going to break it into panels, but because it's an undulating, organic form, each of the panels could actually be a little bit different. They won't all be 100% the same, and adaptive components let us do that. So you sort of put a geometry onto a surface and then map things to it. So we'll do a lot of placing. We're going to do some getting also. Getting elements is basically elements exist in the Revit model. If we're going to get one, we say select model element. If we're going to select a bunch of them, we say select model elements. If we want to get all of the elements of a family, what we do is we tell it what the family is. And then we go ahead and say get all the elements of that family. Okay, so that's how we sort of 
get at things. When it comes time to setting parameters, that's actually pretty easy. What we're going to do is we're going to just basically for every element say set parameter by name. So we give it a value, we give it an element, we give it a value, and we give it a name, and we set it. And finally, we can get things. We can get parameters by name. Or there's some that are very standard, like location is something almost every element has a location, so you can report its x, y, z coordinates. So that's kind of the overview. So in your, your bag of tricks for today, all these things are going to be added in there to, through some different examples. Are those words that you typed into a code block? Yeah. Actually, what happens, oh, actually, they can either be typed into the code block, or most of these are actually function names oh. that you can type into the browser when you get a node. And you're on to a really good question. I'll show you that in one of the examples. For most of these functions, you can either type it into the code block as a string of text, or you can put it in as a function. It kind of works either way. Because the nodes actually just call like the, the underlying code. Okay, so let's go ahead and get ourselves started with some examples. We'll start by just placing elements on a grid. That's example 2.1. Go ahead and open that up if you can. And by opening that up, I mean go on out there to the session two Dynamo examples, download that to your machine, and you should find example 2.1 out there. I'm going to go over to my Revit environment. What's that? Oh, you know what I bet it is? It's this whole thing about I have to publish, blah, blah, blah. Before publishing this, I have to indicate who has the rights. We never used to have this. Hang on. It's about to be not empty. OK, try it now. You might have to give it a refresh. Yep. Excellent. OK. It's a dynamically responsive system. Okay, in terms of placing those elements, I'm going to go ahead and open up 2.1. I'm not going to save my changes. I'm going to open up, go to my folder. Two point one. Inside that folder, and you'll usually find two different things. You'll often find a Revit file and then a Dynamo file. Okay, so let's go ahead and open that up. Take a look. Dynamo file too. It's interesting about why mine is flashing so much. That makes me worry a little bit. Actually, what you can see in here is there's actually a whole bunch of elements out there. There's little like mass elements which are floating around on a field right now. They're kind of these 50 by 50 by 100 boxes. Okay. If you can, just go ahead and delete those because we're going to use the script to place those. So just knock them right out. Was that? Is that good? Then go to the add-ins and we'll open Dynamo and we'll open up the script or the graph. Okay. And when you open that, you'll see what the graph looks like. So let's start on out just by taking a look at this graph. This graph actually has two different parts to it right now. There is a part which is all about creating an XYZ grid, and there's a place, the part about just placing the elements on those grid points. <coughs> but you'll see what I do is I take my nodes and I tend to sort of put them into uh, little boxes, little groups to kind of make them a little more straightforward. What I want to do is actually start by creating a grid. So let me show you a really common way of doing that. There are other ways of doing it, but the simplest way is probably just to go ahead and so go through and set up a code block which has for each of the x and y axes a start value, an end value, and the step value. So what's going to be between there? So let me kind of show you what that does. Let me run this. Is it, is it, is it, 
other window. Okay, I'm gonna close that one. Yep. Okay, now I'll go back and open it. Yes, sir. Yes. Exactly. You only have one what's considered to be the main graph open at a time. So you have to close the old one. Um, after you run, you'll see the points. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That okay. So we have a little script there. On the in the green section of the script or the green section of the graph, we create a grid. And then we're going to place some elements in Revit in the purple section. But go ahead and just run that, and you'll see the points show up. What is the code Okay. Yeah. Let's just kind of talk about that. Okay. Is everyone up? Mostly. Okay. Beautiful. So in creating a grid, the first part over here where the code block is, this is just three numbers, 0, 50, and 5. And what I did was I set up a code block. And just by typing in variable names, this notation which has dot, dot is basically you know, constructing a sequence. So from the start to the end to the step. So I'm going to go from 0 to 50, OK, putting something every 5. OK? And how I created that? It's really, it's the same as, pop out over here. It's just really just the same as 0, 50, 50. oops, I have to run that. Okay. So it would look like that. If I did the same sort of thing, 0, 50, I did that by 10. To run that always. But that's to distinguish it from 0 to 50. If I do pound sign 10, that does something a little bit different. That makes 10 increments. So it's really just whether you're going to count the number of points in the list. It's like these screens are overdriven. Now I'll get that every. Okay, and what I did here in terms of making these variables is when you do a code block, you can say if you just do value one, dot dot, value two, dot dot, value three, every time you type in something that could be an undefined variable, it'll create just an input for the node so that you can put things in there. But it's really the same way as creating any formula. We could go through and say, oh, A plus B times C. And it'll give us those inputs and give us those outputs. It's just the way we sort of define formulas. But that's just sort of a special construct. So the result of all this 0 to 50 to 5 should be just a list. So 0, 5, 10. 20, 30. <coughs> that is really funny. I'm trying to I'm figure out whether I can fix this for you so you can see this a little bit better. Now let me show you a little variation on this. Okay, I'm going to say, I'll do another one that goes 0, uh, let's say 30. So for every x value, it takes the y value as, or 
takes uh, every number in your array as a y value. Actually, in this case, what it's going to do, it's going to like cross plot between <coughs> 0 to 50 and 0 to 50 and give you all the intermediates. Let me kind of show you this. I'll, I'll sort of give you an uneven one. This one's a little bit different. This is just 0 to 30 by 10, so it's just 0, 10, 20, 30. So this gray grid will look, or grid will look a little bit different. Okay, so now it's just 4 by 10. It's a little bit. So what's happening is by putting the same in both directions, we're just getting a square grid, okay, as opposed to you know, having this as being a series for the y's and that's a series for the x's. Now, in terms of point by coordinates, let me kind of show you a slight variation of that. One thing you have to watch out here, as you work with that, is there's this notion right here of what's called the lacing. And you might see there's actually a bunch of x's right there. That's basically going to give you the cross product. <laughs> when you take two different lists and you sort of operate on them together, you have this choice of either shortest, longest, or cross product. OK, and let me show you what that looks like. The lacing can be shortest, longest, or cross product. If you say shortest, what will happen is, okay, it'll basically just kind of consider, oh, it'll give you the first three points or the first four points because the shortest list was four points. So it says this list and that list and match the first one here, the first one there, the second one here, the second one there, third to third, fourth to fourth. You say, oh, okay, the shortest list only had four elements, therefore I'll stop. Okay. Another way to do it, is to switch on over here and say, let's do the longest. And what the longest does is it again says, super. I'll take these values first to first, second to second, third to third, fourth to fourth. Okay, that's the first four points. Okay, for the fifth point, hey, I ran out of points, so what do I do? I'll just keep on using the last one again and again and again, which is why I did that. So it just fills in with the last value. Okay. Now, neither of those is actually what we want. We want this thing called the cross product, which is take the first by the first, first by the second, first by the third, second by the first, second by the second, second by the third, third by the first, third by the second, third by the third, and just do the complete matrix, like multiply them. And that's how you get a grid. <laughs> so that's called lacing as a cross product. But super, we've got this fantastic looking grid of points here. That's all we need to do is create the grid. Okay. If you slide on out. Yeah, can we also follow the cross product rules? Like if I give an x by y matrix times mm -hmm. a y by x matrix. Oh, that, that, I, a y by y matrix? that I don't know. I have, we have to play with that. Okay. I, I don't guarantee that. I would like to say yes, but I don't guarantee that. Step. So super, in my model, I say that's where we're computing. We computed a grid, a bunch of points. You know, in this case, they weren't really based on any inputs. They just kind of came from scratch. Now we're going to come on over here. We're going to place some elements. So we're going to use some slightly different functions. We're going to go through and use a function called family distance by point. It takes a point. And we have to tell it what family to place all these points. So it'll take that family and just place it all these different points. Now, I'm putting this big old box in there, which is why in my Revit model right there, you can see all those big old boxes hanging around. Okay. If I change it to another family type, what else do we have in there? Oh, I want something that's kind of smallish. I could take, oh, the ever so popular RPC Alex. That was a rich photorealistic person. Or uh, it was from the, uh, the, uh, the rendering days. Or I could take, oh, the Beetle, the little car. You like the Beetle? Okay. And when we run that, you'll see what it does. Which is a bunch of beetles in there. It's interesting, though, it's only putting them in the first row. There might be some other ones on top of it, something like that. 
But basically the idea is, or what's going on with my, no, it should be there. You basically place elements at those points. Similarly, if you choose, oh, what do I want to do in here? Yeah, that makes me a tree, that will work. Run that. Yes? As opposed to the cross, or where? As opposed, I think it's default to the longest in the file you gave us. Because I have cross product, and I still get one. And cross product also gave, gives you one. Well, why That's you interesting. Have, but if you do shortest, why should that happen? Because I think it takes the first element of the beetle array, which yeah. is just beetle yeah. or tree, or whatever family type you give. Yeah, yeah. It takes the entire list array as one. Oh, object, maybe one. it's it's on the yeah. lacing over here. On the family point. But leasing gets, well, I mean, it just gives you one row, right? Yeah, because it's really, it is just one on, well, but it is sort of a one on one, isn't it? I think so. It's a little bit. It just yeah. gives you one row. Now, we're sure, because what is it? We're giving it a list, think about it, we're giving it a list of points, and the other thing is one item. So it should just be one. It's interesting about why it should be shortest versus longest. It's funny. I would think it would want to be longest. Yep. I'm perfectly willing to accept the fact that it stopped with a one. Oh, it's interesting it gave you one row. Well, it's, it's taking the first row of the matrix. It took the first, it took the zeroth entry of each of the sublists in the main list. Yeah. That's very interesting. There still seems it's, it's, it's counterintuitive to me, right? As opposed to the cross product, it's interesting. Okay, yeah, that's, that still seems like the wrong behavior. But again, we'll go with it. <laughs> okay. I have another question. Then. Yes. Uh, for me, it's placing the family outside some of the grid points. Yeah, and that just has to do with the placement point is in the family relative to where the grid points are. That's okay. It's really, oh, there's nothing to it. But, but the idea is, the question is really, where is the placement point for that thing? It's like, everything has a placement point, so even though the element is off, it's, it's just one, one could get this. Well, in, in this case, I think you, have a, you, you even have a very funny object, because it's displayed, really, yeah, that's, that's kind of, it sort of depends on the core point. So that's sort of a simpler object. Um, Let's go back to the box again. How about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
they look a little odd right now, but that's just because of sort of the size and the shape of them all. But you can see there's a bunch in there. There's one row of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, but let's then change that a little bit. Because, yeah, at some level, yeah, don't get too hung up on the details of this. Let's just kind of uh, just say that we got an item, a bunch of things, and they're hanging on a grid. I'm going to switch these back to being the box shape. It's this issue of the lacing over here. So again, it's this whole issue of as it's coming in there, what's coming in. So a single item versus a whole, in this case, array of points. Although it's interesting, what's going on here? That gives me another idea about how maybe to solve this. It's a list of lists of lists. Hang on, let me try this another way to do this. So I think this may be the way to do it. Let's come over here. Let's do something. I'm, like, I'm, I'm experimenting right now, so uh, let me just try something here. Because I think part of the problem is this is what's considered to be a list of lists. There's rows and then points in each of the rows, or columns and points within each of the columns. So what I'm going to try and do is actually do something like this called list flatten. It's funny, they change the program around. Sometimes things matter, sometimes they don't. List flatten does this. It takes a list, okay, and you flatten the list by amount. That's really just taking out a layer of hierarchy. Okay, and the reason you do that is, what you want is not a list that's hierarchical, but you just want a single flat array. You're going to find as we're working, a lot of times the difference between success and failure really is just messing around with just what level the list is at. Oh, I, all the tests are to the right, so you can actually see what's going on. The screen's just so messed up, it's hard for you to see. So let me try just taking this flat list of points over here and running with that. Now let me come back over here and try the whole cross product again or longest. Yeah, now they're okay. Let me zoom on out. So actually, Angie, I think longest is going to work. We just have to flatten the list, because what's going to happen is the reason it was only getting on the first row is because they were sort of bunched up in there. So mm -hmm. that's a little error I got to fix within there. It's, but let me just kind of go back to this whole issue of flattening just a little bit so you sort of see what the idea is there. And that's, for better or for worse, something we end up playing with a lot. That is, we really want to put them at a list of points, that thing's expecting a list of points. What's happening is, this list has got a nice looking list, except it's got some hierarchy to it. It's a list of lists. And by flattening it, we just sort of swap that a level of hierarchy so that all, you know, 100 <coughs> points or all, what is it? Yeah, 36 points, something like that, are all hanging around over there, like uh, independently. And if you made the amount to? The amount to where? Oh, down there? Oh, try that. that change? I, I don't think that'll make a difference. No, it doesn't. Okay. Because. But, but it's not the highest. Exactly, it's flattening. Oh, and that's just actually getting out to the whole array. Yeah, it's, but it's, yeah, it's, you'll see it. There, there's going to be a time when we have two and three levels deep. And it really, what it keeps on doing is it basically always, it collapses out the highest level of the hierarchy. So it's like you've outvented all the things that are like one level. Okay. So putting things just hanging out there like that is actually pretty straightforward. It's all, again, computing something like the geometry you want to work with. But the function for actually placing the components is very straightforward. Just give it some sort of family type, say family instance by point. If I give it a nice flat list of points, it would go through and put them out there. That's kind of good. Now, in terms of working with these, though, let's go back over. 
Yeah, Angad was sort of commenting on, you know, it's kind of messy in terms of what's going on over here because these boxes are kind of hanging around. It's just kind of, it doesn't look right in terms of what's going on. You can see where the porn star, where that is. One problem is we have these big old boxes and these big old boxes are actually sort of much bigger than my grid spacing, so it's kind of hard to tell what's going on here. So let's go ahead and enhance this a little bit. Here's the deal. I have all these little guys hanging around out here. They're fine. They have parameters like width and length, okay? And if I would like to change the width and length to sort of make them a little more appropriate to the scale of what my grid is and stuff like that, what I'd like to actually do is just set these parameters. I'd like to set the parameter length and I'd like to set the parameter width to some new values, okay? And it's easy to do in the Dynamo script. A lot of times we do this. That's really the essence of the attractor or the, or the lapeller is we change the size of things based on the distance away from other things. So it would be either bigger or smaller, depending on how close you are to something. But it really comes just by changing these parameters. So we could change those manually. You could sort of see that I could choose one of those and say, great, it's 10 feet by 10 feet, or two feet by two feet, or whatever it's gonna be. But because we can change it in Revit, we can go through and change it in Dynamo. And that's one of the key things to sort of get into. One of the best ways to sort of test things in Dynamo is see if you can change it in Revit. If you can't change it in Revit, chances are Dynamo is not going to do it either because Dynamo just really automates what you do in Revit. Okay, you have access to some other things that aren't in Revit, but it starts with that. So let's go back over to my little script and see how we can implement that. The idea is I have a whole series of family instances right here. So if I go over to that last thing and I expand down and sort of say, let's take a look what's in there, you'll see it's a whole bunch of these objects. And you'll see a bunch of objects in a list. They've all got this ID with them. They're all individually addressable objects. If I'd like to take all those objects and just change their size, it's easy. There's a function that we're going to use called setting parameter by name. So let me see if I can get to it. I'll shove that in over there. I'll say element dot set. And you'll see set parameter by name is one of the ones that comes up. So if I choose that, let's think about what it wants to be fed with. Element is looking for just some sort of Revit element, so I can take those families and bring them across, all those family instances. It wants a parameter name, so for a parameter name, it's just looking for some string otets. That's all it's looking for. So I can go through and just type in a code block by double clicking, say, oh, I want to put height in here. I also want to put some value in here, so I can put that in as a separate code block, or I can just put it right in here, separating them by semicolons. Let's say two. So now I'm going to take height and two. Actually, the height, I thought it was width or something like that. Where did it go? It's width and length. Okay, I can't remember. Have to spell it just the same. So we'll run that. Close that back out. Okay, they got a whole lot skinnier. Okay, similarly, I can go through and do that same set parameter by name. Actually, this is something you can do where it actually pays to do a little copying and pasting. If I also want to adjust the length parameter, what I can do is grab those two, copy and paste. Copy and then paste. They'll show up just to the side. Well, they probably look 
taller relative. Let's see what's going on here. Yes. If I don't want to put uh, the value in that code block, yes. I want to put a different block. Do I have to name that block? If it's Say it again. So, for example, if I don't want to put two in the code block, yep. and I want to put in a slider. Yes. Uh, it's throwing an error at me. Let's take a look. Well, we won't put it in the code block. Let's do this. Let's uh, let me just do this. Come back out here. Let's see how we're doing. We got all those little guys. Okay, they're all looking kind of skinny. It's the only thing they're off. So they'd have to do something with the placement point on that object. That placement point might actually be up in the corner or something like that. But we can get to that. That's just not a very well designed part. In terms of putting a slider in there, that should be A-OK. -okay, because if we go through and say that we want like a slider, and we say like maybe an <coughs> integer slider or a number slider, either way. And we put that in as the value. That should work out OK. So you don't put it in the code block, but what you do is you put it in, although you could put it at the input of the code block, but then it's in the variable name. But this is, so now the value is zero. It probably is not going to like that, just because nothing likes to have a value where the width is zero. Yeah. So maybe I have to make that go to 1 to 20. Now, this is a case where you may want to go through and turn on automatic. This is really not so complicated that it's really going to matter a whole lot. So if I turn on auto, and you want to see the effect of those sliders, you can. Start seeing that respond in the background. And let me zoom back out here. We'll do a little cleaning up of uh, this uh, function here. So I'm going to pull that one over. I'll leave the slider there. I'll put this one over here, leave that there. So this is, again, a case where I would probably, at this point, group that. Create a group. And I'll just call that, like, set the hyphen or the length. Just so they're hanging together. So that's a little bit easier. Again, it leaves good documentation for people to see. But the whole idea is a little computation, place some elements, adjust the parameters. That's kind of it. There's really not much more to it. Okay, we'll go through some variations, but when it comes to placing standard Revit elements, independent of all sorts of things about what parameters are available and where the placement point is relative to where the object shows up, it pretty much is just choosing the element family instance by point and putting it there. Now, a lot of Revit elements are really good at doing that. You know, desks, chairs, anything that's a Revit family which has a distinct placement point tends to be very good. There's some things that aren't so good. We're going to play around with Windows in a little while, and you're going to find out that Windows are a little bit strange because they're a hosted element. They sort of only exist relative to the wall. So they're a little bit weird. Okay? And we're also going to talk about adaptive components, which use more than a single start with this. Okay, so let us do this. Let's take a break now, please. If you can, come on back in about five minutes. Grab some water, whatever you like. And when you do, we will continue by looking at some adaptive